Hey, welcome back. Uh, let's continue from where we stopped. Uh, so we're looking at why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 said there's a certain order. So the first one we looked at was because of establishment, right? Uh, the early church was founded. And so I just gave that example where in the church, uh, you know, we can, uh, with the fivefold ministry, whatever we need, whatever uh, there's a need in our lives or uh, people's life, they can go to the concerned person. It it brings order in within the church. Now, the second reason why there was this whole list and why Paul wrote first and second was because of responsibility and authority, right? Now, remember this, in the church, if there is no authority, meaning if there's no order, it's not going to function properly. There's going to be confusion. There's going to be strife. Right? So the reason why these, you know, have, have been set in place, these different, uh, you know, uh, functions have been set in place is so that there are certain responsibilities and certain authorities that are placed on that person. Right? So for example, if there is a there's a evangelist or a teacher, he's been given certain responsibilities and certain functions within the church, right? So he has certain authorities, right? He can you know probably uh, begin to teach people from the word of God. It's not like the pastor is going to come and say, "Why are you teaching people?" No, because that is his uh, the authority has already been given to him, right? So these are two important reasons. First one, so that there's order in the church. And two, so that there's governmental authority and proper leadership in the church. Right Now, let's look at the next point. Point eight. There is anointing, an anointing that goes with every ministry gift. Very, very, very important. What is anointing? Anointing is, I, I'm sure we all know what the anointing is. It is God pouring out his presence into our lives, His the power of the Holy Spirit upon our life. Now, with each anointing, there is, with each ministry gift, there is an anointing. Let me give you this example. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when I say Billy Graham? I think the first thing that came to your mind is evangelist, right? I'm sure none of us said the uh, pastor, right? And probably if you say Billy Graham and you close your eyes, the first thing you're going to look, think of is these huge meetings with thousands of people, right? You know that he was an evangelist. And another thing that you may think of when you say Billy Graham is the hundreds and thousands of places that he went bringing the gospel to people right? and the many, many, many souls that were touched through his ministry. So, you know, there was a, there's an anointing of the evangelist in him. How did he know it? He didn't know it. Right. If you read about his life, all he did was he wanted to go tell people about Jesus. And to his surprise, he formed a team of about five people. And when they went and started this, to his surprise, there were hundreds of people who turned up. Now he didn't expect that. Right? He didn't expect hundreds and hundreds of people. By the time it was his fifth uh, you know, outdoor meeting, there were thousands that were gathering. Now you must understand this, right? People came not because of how he looks or how he speaks or uh, you know, whether he is uh, you know uh, a rich person or nothing. People came because they saw the anointing of God upon his life. It is simple as that. Now, you can fool maybe 10 people, but you can't fool thousands of people. right? There was an anointing upon his life. So you know that he was an evangelist. Now look at Paul Yonggi Cho, Paul David, David Paul Yonggi Cho, right? the biggest church in Korea. Now, did he know that he is going to be a pastor? No. When you look at his life, 
he uh, he didn't really understand all of these things all he wanted to do was tell people about his testimony he would say this is what i was i was going to die god healed me now i want to bring the same gospel the same jesus to everyone so i'm starting a small group he started a small group in his house little did he know that out of this within a year there would be thousands of people coming to the church now if you seen uh, paul yongi chu he's he's a very short man very uh, very you know uh, cut off in his speech but when he opened his mouth there was an anointing that flowed from his mouth he was a man of prayer right and and when you look when you see him you know that god has called him to be a pastor right it was a pastoral ministry upon his life right so like this there are many of them there are people who uh, god has called to be apostolic in nature all they do is they go places plant churches hand it over to others and move about move on then there are people who have been called for the prophetic ministry now in the early 90s the prophetic ministry began to explode people began to understand that hey i everyone can prophesy not only the so called prophet but everybody can prophesy and so there was this whole move of of the of the holy spirit there was this whole you know the starting of prophetic worship and all these things that came up came about right but there were people who had the anointing of a prophet right meaning they were very very prophetic in nature whenever they spoke they was they were prophetic now let me give you this best example there was a man named david burkus pastor david burkus started his own church uh you know in 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 the in the united states and I'm sure if you read the book uh uh the cross and the switchblade he talks about how he went out and you know uh, between gangs and leaders and gangs and drug addicts and he started a church uh, but he came back to new york started a beautiful church but there was a certain point in his life as he was pastoring the church he said he said to himself hey i feel so dry and famous people know me people call me all over the world and he travels but he said i feel so dry i feel like the anointing has left me and he was feeling miserable as a pastor he said he told his church you know what i'm going to take a break because all that i'm teaching is something that i already know right i want a fresh anointing i want a fresh revelation so he took a break and when he would spend time in prayer god told him there is this prophetic function also that i am giving you and he started to explore he started to explore the prophetic he started to pray and ask the holy spirit and in the early 1980s about 10 years after his start of the church of his ministry 10 years later he began to prophesy prophetic ministry and his ministry he, he if you go back and look on on youtube you see that he was one of them who prophesied about the uh, the twin towers being destructed he was he also prophesied about uh, you know famine and a plague coming uh, and, and so he has uh, you know prophesied some really uh, wonderful messages so the the anointing that god gives us comes with the ministry gift right so so for example if god has called you to be a worship leader all you need is the anointing of god right you can sing the most simple song the most common you can even sing a sunday school song if it is anointed from god it will touch people's life or if you if you are called to be uh, you know somebody who is you know just Uh, serving in the church if god has anointed you and you're doing this with the anointing of god upon your life you will make an impact in what you're doing right because remember it is the anointing that makes a difference right so here's what i want to really emphasize do not try to do ministry without the anointing of god 
because it may look like ministry, but in God's eyes, it will not be ministry. And I know this may be a little hard, but it's true. Right? There are times where I had to pause and say, God, I, I feel empty. We've just been giving out, preaching, teaching, leading worship, doing all these things. But now I feel empty. I need a fresh anointing. Now, here's another very important thing. God gives us gifts, right? So, for example, if some of you are, uh, you feel you're prophetic in nature, God's called you to be a prophet or a pastor or an apostle. There's an anointing, but there's a cost to the anointing. And I hope you're getting what I'm saying, right? There's a cost, there's a price that we must pay. What is the price? We must spend time. And everyone are sleeping 10 hours. We may have to, you know, sacrifice our sleep. When everyone are you know, enjoying themselves, we may have to spend time alone with God. And everyone are having a comfortable life. God may ask you to fast for 40 days. Right? There's a cost involved. Right? That's why I started in the uh, beginning of last session. I said, through ministry, through intimacy, intimacy with God is the only way that we can do true ministry. Right? Without the anointing, we cannot do ministry. Remember uh, in the book of Acts, uh, the Apostle Paul, the sons of Sceva came and said, uh, we'll also drive out these demons with the same name. We'll also do the same formula which Paul used. What is that? In the name of Jesus. So they tried it. What happened? Demons themselves said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Meaning what? Where is your anointing? I don't see anything inside you. Outside you are, you look like a, a priest's son or whatever, priest's children. But I don't see any anointing inside you. So, Jesus I know because he's anointed of God. Paul I know, he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. But who are you? Isn't that powerful? Imagine if demons think of us that way. Say, Jesus I know, but who are you? You can't tell the devil, hey, I'm, I'm in the ministry for 10 years. The devil, the devil is going to say, I, it doesn't matter to me. I don't see the anointing. I mean, I'm not scared of you because there's no anointing inside. And so we must change that. The moment we are anointed, we have to keep on with a fresh anointing. Say, God, this, you know, it's like a refill, right? Example, you have a bottle of water, you, you finish drinking it. You don't ask the water to come to you. You have to go get the water stand or sit or whatever and fill the bottle there's something that you must do so there will come a time especially those of us in ministry or workplace just feel drained out say god i'm preaching the same messages uh, it's not been ministering to me and i feel that I mean, people are saying it's nice because they are listening uh, but i need something new the moment we think that way, the moment we say, God, something fresh, a new revelation, that's the anointing that will bring people to us. Right? It is the anointing. God will bring people to us. It is nothing else. Right? Um, and, and there are many instances in my life where, I've, uh, where I can share where, you know, I've tried things on my own ability. Uh, you know, but it, it really stressed me out. End of the day, I was stressed out. Thank God, what is this? Uh, I thought ministry should be a joy and it should be fun. Yes, it's tiring, but it should be a joyful thing. But I'm getting stressed out. God very clearly ministered to me. You're trying it on your own. Just pray for the anointing of God. God himself will send people to you, to work with you, to be with you, to minister with you. And it's true. Right? So each one of us, remember, the anointing is what makes the difference. Imagine this, you know, we feel, okay, hey, I'm an apostle. God has called me to be an apostle. And you started off well. But somewhere in between, we gave up. 
right? And there's no fresh anointing. What happens? The enemy is not going to worry whether we are a boss or a prophet or all of it. He is going to come all guns blazing to bring us down. But if we have the anointing, even if the, the enemy comes, he's not going to defeat us because the anointing of God is in us. Remember what Jesus said did? after he was baptized? He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And what did he do? He did such wonderful miracles. He walked on water. He raised people from the dead. All these miracles. How? Through the anointing of God. Right? If there was no anointing, you know, Jesus would have, wouldn't have done all this. He was anointed of God. That's why. Why do you think demons came and fell at his feet? Saying, oh, have, why have you come so early to, you know, destroy us? Demons came and fell. Why? Because they saw the anointing. The enemy knows the anointing you and I have. Right? So, prepare yourselves. Prepare yourselves. Ask God for a fresh revelation. Drink from him more and more, right? Next point, God will take a person through preparation, stages of preparation, growth and development, right? In their ministry gift. Now, just because God may speak to me saying that, okay, Paul, I want you to be a pastor. Doesn't mean in one year I become a pastor. If it happens, it's good. But if it doesn't happen, it's also good. Why? Because God takes a person through stages of preparation and development. Right? It's it's growth. Right? Very rarely has God used people, and we've talked about this many times. Very rarely God has used people like immediately. Oh, you want to do this? Okay, take go and do it. No. He's always prepared them. Right? And and I'm sure we've we've seen these said these words many times preparation time is never wasted time right it's never a time where we can say okay this is waste why am i sitting here why am i doing this well, god's called me to be something but i'm doing something else no it is preparation don't be in a hurry to fulfill you know what you and i want to do and give god time give god be open to God, be open to the anointing. Let him make a way for you. And that is the best way. Right? Now, if we do it in a hurry, it's only going to cause a delay. Right? Say, hey, I want to be a pastor. I want to start my own church. If you know that, it's okay. Give time. Hey, God, prepare me. Because I don't want to be become a pastor I'm just out of, you know, because I want to be and immediately become a pastor. And then there's no anointing. There's no preparation. The devil will so easily bring destruction upon us or he can easily just cause us to fail. Right? So let God go take us through those preparation times. Right? Uh, there's a book called The Grand Weaver by Ravi Zacharias. And I always use this example. He says, God used Moses in a palace, God prepared Moses in a palace, used him in the desert, and he prepared Joseph in the desert and used him in the palace. So, so don't be afraid of preparation time. Go through those stages. It's wonderful. Look at the bigger picture, right? Uh, a person may have more than one ministry gift, right? Like in First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7, Let's read that. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 7. Where unto I am ordained a preacher. And, and, and apostles, I speak the truth in Christ, and I lie not. The teachers of the Gentiles is faith and verity. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abu Bakr. So, so here Paul is saying, I'm a teacher and a apostle. 
right? That's what he says. I'm a teacher and an apostle of Christ. So there will be times God will take a person through stages and, and, and a person can have one or more ministry gifts, right? So it's okay to flow in both. Right? Don't, don't uh, limit yourself. So, for example, you know, uh, in church, you may have a worship leader who's also a good teacher to different gifts. Go with it. Uh, don't limit yourself. Or you may have somebody who's very evangelistic in nature. Right? He wants to go and reach out. But he's also a pastor. Or he's also a teacher. So there can be two or three ministry gifts that we that can get combined uh, and and it can be given to a person right so don't be afraid and don't think to yourself no what am i am i this am i that and that remember the point we discussed first what is the main reason of the fivefold ministry to equip the saints so as long as you are equipping the saints whether you're pastor prophet evangelist it's okay it doesn't matter the work is being done, equipping the saints, building the body of Christ. So that's the bigger picture, right? Now it's good if you if you know it and you recognize your gift, very good, right? You can focus on that. Uh, but if you have two, three gifts, then praise God. You know, you, God has blessed you with two, three gifts. Don't look at it as a burden. Oh, why I have to lead worship also? Why do I have to? Now church also, they have to prepare the message, and I have to lead worship, and I have to, you know, teach during the you know school of ministry, and I have to do. No, if you look at it as a burden, then you know it becomes. You know, God will not be pleased with that. Why? Because it's a gift God is giving us. There are many people who don't have it, who want it, who have been praying for it. But if God has given to you, praise God, take it, use that gift for His for His work, right? Right. Any questions? Any thoughts uh, before I go ahead to the next point? Any questions? Anything you'd like to share? Okay. Shall we go ahead? All right. Okay. So let's go to the 11th point. Now, the Lord Jesus stands as our primary example for each and every ministry gift. Now, we know the Lord Jesus is a full package, right? He is everything. He is God. He He's the one. He's the true apostle, the true prophet, the true evangelist, the true pastor, and the true teacher, right? He, the Lord Jesus, exemplified all these ministry gifts. But it's interesting to see, you know, the Lord Jesus didn't say, I will not go to places, let people come to me. Did he say that? He didn't say that. So he, he was also an evangelist. The Lord Jesus was prophetic in nature. He was, he was a pastor. He shepherded the people. He was a teacher with wonderful parables that he spoke of. Right? Uh, and so... The Lord Jesus was the best example, is the best example uh, of you know the ministry gifts. Now let's look at the first, all five of them, and look at the verses. Well, first one, how is Jesus an apostle? Hebrews chapter three, verse one. Yes, we look at each and also read the verse. So first one, apostle, Hebrews chapter three, verse one. Yes, could any one of us please read that? Hebrews three and verse one. Maybe somebody else could uh, open to Matthew 13, 57, the next verse. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Amen. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Lord Jesus was the is is our apostle and the high priest of our confession right let's read the second one prophet matthew chapter 13 verse 57 matthew chapter 13 verse 57 and they took offense at him but jesus said to them only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor Amen. 
Thank you, Zafina. Yeah, so only in his hometown is a prophet without an honor. So again, the Lord Jesus is calling himself the prophet as well, right? And definitely, Jesus was very prophetic in nature, obviously, because the Holy Spirit was working powerfully in him. He spoke, God spoke directly to him, and he was very, very, very prophetic in nature. So, and he says that only in his own hometown was a prophet uh, not honored. Let's look at the next one. How did he fulfill the role of an evangelist? Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Luke 19 and verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Thank you, Anita. So the Son of Man has come to seek and save that was lost. Now, you know, we, we studied, right? The work of an evangelist is to go, seek people, search people, save them, preach the gospel to them, bring them into Christ's kingdom. That's his major responsibility. And so he's, the Lord Jesus is saying, the Son of Man has come to seek and save those who are lost. The work of an evangelist. And we also see, like, he's not just saying it, but he showed it with his actions as well. The Lord Jesus didn't sit only in Jerusalem, right? He didn't say, "I'm this is my church, this is where I'm going to sit. And he was not with the 12 people, disciples just sitting around there. No, he went to Judea, he went to Samaria, he went to different places, uh, you know, and ministered the gospel. He went, right? And he brought the gospel to people. Imagine uh, the Samaritan woman. Right? That's a perfect example of the work of an evangelist, right? And if you look at any evangelist, they will take this sermon and beautifully summarize the whole thing because they know how, what it feels like. Right? Jesus is going there. He sits near the well. He's drinking water. He, he's feeling thirsty. And a woman is there. What does he do? Start a conversation. And that's what evangelists do. They're the best in starting a conversation. And, and you see how the, you know, the Lord Jesus so wonderfully brought the gospel in. And she was saved, right? Was it a big evangelistic meeting? No, one person. But that one person went and touched many other lives. There were other evangelistic meetings also, right, on the mountains. But we see that he did do these evangelists, evangelism, right? And also we look at the workings of miracles and wherever he went, he healed people. That's what evangelist does. Right, so he fulfilled even that responsibility. The fourth one, pastor. Now we know that Jesus didn't have a church. There was no concept of the church during when he was there. Uh, but how did he pastor? The word pastor simply means shepherd, right? So how did he shepherd the people? John chapter ten, verse eleven to sixteen. Yes, any one of us can read. John chapter 10, 11 to sixteen. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Amen. Thank you so much, Rosalind. So, so wonderful here. He's saying, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, right? So Jesus is, uh, he, he himself is saying, hey, I'm a shepherd. I even look after you. What's the role of a pastor? To look after the people, to shepherd them. And they're falling, to help them up. And they go astray, to bring them back. And Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I will look after your needs. I will look after you, right? And he gives this wonderful parable later on. And he says, the parable of the lost sheep. 1900, 
there are 99, one goes away, but he goes and searches for that one. You know what's interesting? He leaves those 99 in a safe place. He doesn't just say, okay, you 99, you'll do what you want. Let me go and get that one that was lost. No, he leaves the 99 in a safe place, goes and brings that one. That is the heart of a shepherd. Now, if any one of us are in pastoral ministry, you can feel this, right? Uh, you can, you know, resonate with what I'm trying to explain here. Even if one person from your church says, no, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't want this, and goes away, you will be so hurt. Say, God, why is this happening? You may not even sleep for a couple of days because it's just going to, you know, cause so much of distraction and disturbance in your mind. Why? Because you are a shepherd to their lives. Now, who's put that? He may be somebody from a different city, different town, different language, but he's part of your church. Why do you feel that way when they leave and they go? That's because God has put that anointing in you. That gift is in you, the pastoral gift, where you have to look after the sheep that God has given to you. So it's hurtful. You will do all you can to bring that one person back. And the Lord Jesus did that as a pastor, as a shepherd. He looked after his sheep. And best example would also be after Jesus died, right? Uh, uh, he came back uh, and he met with the disciples. And he didn't tell the disciples, now I have to choose another new 12 people. You will all have abandoned me. No. He, he, choose, he says, hey, you are my sheep. You are the ones there with me for three and a half years. You are still my sheep. Even though you are not there, you, you are my sheep. You have to continue the work. Right? So we see this heart of forgiveness, a heart of just receiving back. That's the heart of a pastor. Right? Uh, many times, you know, there are people who spoke, who will speak, or who have spoken, will speak against us as pastors. And sometimes it's very hurtful because it may be from people that we really care about. But take this example of Jesus. You know, the disciples weren't even there, and he was probably just so much he was in so much pain physical emotional mental pain nobody was there with him but jesus received them back he said peter you denied me three times but you have to lead the church now you have to lead my people they are like sheep they are going astray they, there is no shepherd you have to shepherd them now so you see this whole you know aspect of god's love and the heart of forgiveness that a pastor has and we see that here uh, very beautifully in jesus's life finally as a teacher there are plenty of examples but let's read matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 matthew 9 35. then jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in the in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people Hey Amen. Thank you, Zeli. I like that order. Right? The, uh, can you repeat that order, Zeli? First one was Jesus went about. Jesus went about all the cities and villages. Okay. What did he do there? Teaching in their synagogues. Teaching. Okay. Secondly. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Preaching. And healing every sickness yeah. and every disease among yeah. the people. Thank you. Thank you, Zeri. Thank you so much. First, Jesus went. He taught them. Right? And many places, you know, Nathaniel comes and says, Teacher, tell us. Or they say, Rabbi. The word Rabbi means teacher. Right? Tell us. Tell us about what you were saying. Or the parable of the sower. Nobody understood it. Tell us. Teacher, what great teacher. The Roman centurion says, Oh, teacher, great teacher. Tell us. The Pharisees themselves couldn't control themselves. From where did he learn so much? How did he get such an understanding to teach this way? Right. Where did this wisdom come from? He taught people with so much power, with so much authority. And then these beautiful parables that he came up with, you know, uh, life examples. The parable of the Samaritan was, I'm sure if, 
you know, if we take a context and read about it, if there were Jews there, they, he could have got stoned at that moment by the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they hate the Samaritans. You can't be talking about a Samaritan and that too, a good Samaritan. There is no good Samaritan, right? Uh, but he's teaching them. He's teaching them about, about kingdom values. He's teaching them about a kingdom lifestyle. He's a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Right? What did, Matthew 9.35 says, he went about in cities, towns, and villages. First one, he taught them. What did he teach them? He told them, hey, this is what the gospel is. This is what God told Abraham. This is what God told Moses. And now uh, we are living in... So he would have preached the whole gospel, teaching them. Right? Uh, and we also see in the life of Apostle Paul. He was a wonderful teacher. Remember, he was uh, in this, in, I think it was his second missionary journey, and he was teaching and teaching and teaching, and he went on teaching the whole night. Whole night that that boy fell off from the window and died. But what did he do after that? What he thought, he put it into action. And he prayed and he was brought back to life. Follow the example of Jesus. Jesus taught them, he preached the gospel. And he did healings, wonders, and miracles. So we see that the Lord Jesus is all five. So none of us can say, God, uh, Lord, you you don't know how it is to be an apostle. He knows. We don't know how it is to be a prophet. He knows. Right? You don't know how it is to be an evangelist, to go to places and you know stay in these places, which are so terrible, or and you no know, reach out. He knows. He probably knows it even more because uh, now nowadays when, when we look at what's what we have now, it's so easy. You know, you take a train, you take a bus, you take a flight, you reach. Imagine during Jesus' time, you had to take a boat and half the time the seas were you know, causing troubles. Half the time the enemy was behind him. But through all of it, he did everything that God had called him to do can't say that, God, you don't know how it is to be a pastor. No, he's a good shepherd. He knows. He knows when we fail. He knows our brokenness. He knows our hurts. He knows when people ridicule and mock us for wrong reason. He knows. Did they all applaud Jesus? No, they didn't. They all said, be, take, you know, be done with this person. He's saying before, Abraham was, I am. we got to kill him. Right? Um, they didn't accept his message. So there are times when people will not accept us. It's okay. Make sure you're right with God. Right? And God understands that. Right? Finally, being a teacher, he definitely will give us the wisdom. He'll give us revelations. Every time you open God's word and you pray, God will give us revelations. Because he's the great teacher. He can take a verse and bring out 10 different aspects in that one verse. But we try it from ourselves on our own. We'll be stuck with the same old you know, message. So Jesus exemplified all these ministry gifts. Finally, the last point. There is a difference between the ministry function and the ministry gift. And we just talked about that as well, right? Every one of us can be an evangelist. God has said, go and preach the gospel, right? So all of us can go and evangelize, and we must go and evangelize, right? That is a ministry gift that God has given each one of us, all believers. We must share the gospel. Now, there's a ministry function. The ministry function is... Sorry, I, I think I got that reverse. Many people can function. Sorry, I got that reverse, right? The ministry function is everyone can evangelize. But the ministry gift is like a Billy Graham or an old Oral Robert. Right? Every one of us can be teachers. Right? Every one of us can teach people. But there's a function. Oh, sorry, there's a gift of teaching. Right? So I hope you understood that difference, right? All of us.
can evangelize it's a ministry function but then there's a gift where people are more inclined towards evangelism they see the anointing upon their lives all of us can prophesy right it's a function but you will see some people the ministry gift of the prophetic they will be more inclined to hearing from god and delivering the prophetic the ministry gift is given to a person that makes that person prophet apostle pastor teacher or evangelist so all of us must understand that whatever gift we have our sole intention to use these gifts or a calling or a function whatever it is is to build the body of christ stay away from things that take us away from god let that be our focus god thank you for what you have given me for the gifts for the functions for the talents the abilities and help me to use it for building your kingdom right so we'll bring this session to a close next week uh, we'll start off with the uh, evangelist and then we'll look at uh, jesus as our example we'll go deeper into that and then we'll uh, look at uh, the evangelist in the early church and how the lord jesus uh, there was a restoration in the evangelistic ministry and we'll do the same thing with uh, teacher and then pastor so any questions any any thoughts any anybody has anything you'd like to share please feel free well, we can close in prayer everyone uh, able to track along able to understand just trying to go a little slow so that we you know it's very important that we understand these things yeah. pastor if you can repeat yes. the point 12 again please okay sure 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 yes thank you all right now there is there are two things one is a ministry function one is a ministry gift right now ministry function is basically now for example there's a housewife right I'm going to give you in an example, Rosalind, and everyone can, so that everyone can also understand it well. Imagine there's a housewife, right? Her prime responsibility is to be at home, look after the children, look after the family, take care of the house. That is her calling in life. That's what she's been doing for 10 years. But she loves Jesus, right? So whenever she's free, she goes around in the apartment and she shares people, shares Jesus with people, and she's she likes to evangelize right now that is a ministry function right so she's god has given her that ministry function and right? so she goes she reaches out. now if you look at some people like billy graham and oral roberts that is the ministry gift right where you'll have thousands of people just coming and listening why because it is a gift that god has placed Right. Uh, and I'm not talking only about men, right? There are even wonderful women of God, right? Uh, I forget her name, Amy McPherson, who did a wonderful ministry, um, right? So there are many women. Um, uh, Jackie Pullinger, Heidi Baker, these are all wonderful ministries. So, so this woman is a housewife, but she goes and shares people shares jesus with her neighbors and friends whoever come whoever she comes in contact with and that's a ministry function the ministry gift is somebody who is totally devoted towards that right so he's and you, and you see an anointing of god upon their life right where people will just receive their message or people will just you know well, in the hundreds and the thousands they will see that anointing in their life Right. Can can uh, a housewife share the, be an evangelist? Yes, she can evangelize. That's a ministry function. But then God chooses certain people and gives them a gift, the ministry gift uh, of evangelism, where they'll be able to reach out to thousands of people. Uh, and that's because of the gift that God has given them. Rosalind, I hope that uh, brings some clarity to your question. Yes, Pastor. So. Yeah. Following that, like, can a housewife also be anointed if she 
uh, you know, if she understands that ball upon her life. So from being um, functioning, can she be, um, uh, you know, promoted to that anointing where, uh, like, that gift is in operation? Yeah, that's a very good question, Rosalind. Now, I, I, I just want to change that word. You said promoted, right? It's not like, uh, you know, function is lower and... Uh, uh, no, it's all right. I'm, I'm just uh, trying to uh, make that difference there. Yes, to answer your question, yes, Rosalind. So somebody who is, you know, continually functioning in their gift. And again, God sees faithfulness, right? So there are times when somebody may do it for one year and then get bored. Or two years and get bored but if god sees consistency god sees brokenness remember that verse i love that verse: a broken and a contrite heart god will not you know despise so the more broken we are the more we tell god no i, I have to do this i have to god can turn that function into a gift and all of a sudden it can be a housewife who is just in the house sharing gospel maybe she's sharing for 15 years faithfully god can suddenly tell her okay now i want you to go and do an evangelistic meeting and uh, book the auditorium god can send people to pay for that auditorium and god can bring thousands of people to fill up that auditorium and move that function to a gift but that depends on our brokenness on our willingness on our uh, you know um, drive to know more about God, to gain more from Him, right? So that's, that depends on us. We can either push it away or we can say, God, no, I'm not going to let you go till you really make this uh, a lifestyle in my life, right? So yes, to answer your question, the function can become a gift. Yes, because it's God who, who can do that. So God is not going to restrict He's not going to say this is only a function, so you do this only in your apartment. No, he, he can uh, he can just turn that into a gift. All right, any other question? Well, shall we close? All right, so let's just uh, close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this uh, beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for what we studied today. And the fivefold function that you have given the church, O oh God. And we pray, Lord, that each one of us in the body of Christ, no matter what we are doing, whether it's a function or a gift that you have given us, Lord, help us to have this one thing in mind that we are building your kingdom to equip your saints and to glorify your name, O oh God, that if this is all about you and nothing about us, O oh God. Thank you. We appreciate, Lord. We thank you for the gifts that you've given us. I pray, Lord, that we will walk in humility, yet walk in power and authority and do what you have called us to do, Lord. We speak a blessing over each and every student, Lord, even as they go about in their ministries and their work. Lord, in everything that they're doing, may they recognize and walk in their gifts and functions, Lord. Glorify your name and fulfill their plans and purposes for their lives, Lord. We thank you, Father. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful day ahead. And we'll catch up next week and we'll continue with this. Thank you so much. God bless.